John Maynard Keynes, who went by Maynard to his friends, deserves a brief biographical sketch before we dive into his radical ideas about the economy. It would be right to say that macroeconomics, as a discipline of study distinct from microeconomics, did not exist before Keynes. There was no systematic inquiry into the causes and consequences of the business cycle before Keynes, just a loose collection of thoughts and ideas. In the same way that the orthodoxy of the ancient Greek thinkers like Plato and Aristotle had to be excised by revolutionary new thinking during the Enlightenment, such as by the writings of Adam Smith, now the orthodoxy of classical economics had insulated itself from criticism and was freezing the hands which might be able to counter the boom and bust cycle of the economy. Keynes's contributions in overturning some of that thought make him one of the most influential thinkers of the 20th century. Keynes was born in 1883 in Cambridge, England, to parents who were both academics. He was raised in a middle-class household and was, of course, well-educated himself, attending the famous Eton College and then King's College, Cambridge. While there, Keynes became involved with a group of friends that would come to be called the Bloomsbury Group, which included the author Virginia Woolf, her husband Leonard, the author E.M. Forster, and the painter Duncan Grant, among many others who became important literary or artistic figures and public intellectuals. Keynes met Duncan Grant in 1908, and the two became romantically involved for many years. For most of Keynes's life, he was romantically involved only with other men, and the Bloomsbury group was well ahead of its time in acceptance of homosexuality and feminist thought. Keynes surprised them all, though, and himself, when he fell for a Russian ballerina named Lydia Lopakova in 1921, whom he married, and by all accounts, it was genuine love. His relationship with the other members of the Bloomsbury group, which was focused primarily on art and literature, would profoundly influence his economic work. In 1930, Keynes published a paper called The Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren. In a time of doom and gloom, Keynes suggested that the future still looked bright and that growth would continue. He predicted that 100 years later, in 2030, incomes would have grown exponentially and would be four to eight times higher. We're right on track for the middle of that prediction. 1930 GDP per capita adjusted for inflation to $2020 was $12,258. Actual GDP per capita in 2020 was $63,543. If real GDP per capita keeps growing by about 2% each year, we'll end up with a little over a six-fold increase by 2030. Just like we did when we imagined what economic growth would mean for humanity after a few centuries, Keynes thought this level of income would finally free people from economic problems. He wrote, thus for the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem, how to use his freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy the leisure which science and compound interest will have won for him, to live wisely and agreeably and well. Seeing the trends in the work week, he predicted we would all be working about three hours a day on average for a 15-hour work week. He might have underestimated our willingness to put off the question of how to keep from being bored by willingly keeping the 40-hour work week. But if what I hear from friends and relatives and my own life, time spent actually getting work done might not be so far off from Keynes's estimate. Keynes is the perfect person to serve as the main character of our course. Like the other members of the Bloomsbury group, he challenged the orthodoxy and prized new ways of thinking. He was optimistic and valued liberty and dignity for commerce and he saw the project of economics as working towards the liberation of humankind from scarcity. But he believed this meant something different than making people infinitely wealthy. Instead, the goal is to offer everyone the chance at the good life, full of enriching social relationships, appreciation of art for art's sake, 
and the accomplishment of work that is personally rewarding rather than work that is done strictly for public praise. And of course, because Keynes is considered by all who study it to be the father of economics. Keynes studied under Alfred Marshall, the economist responsible for the supply and demand framework that defines the entire discipline, who begged Keynes to abandon his pursuit of philosophy in order to become an economist. Keynes obliged, and early in his career, he began working for the British government. His brilliance was identified by all, and he quickly became an important figure in the government. At the beginning of World War I, he helped steer the British financial markets through the immediate international crisis. And as we have already covered, he tried his best to steer the entire continent towards a lasting peace, but ultimately spoke against the treaty with his book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace. At the same time, Keynes had an academic career with King's College, Cambridge. In the 1920s, he was put in charge of the college's endowment. He made some unwise investments at first, but quickly found his feet in an investment strategy that not only worked for the college, but for his own finances. He was an early pioneer of diversifying a portfolio and engaged in value investing, searching for stocks which appeared fundamentally underpriced. He made his own fortune, which he used to buy a newspaper that could then employ his friends in the Bloomsbury Group. He lost it all in the great crash of 1929, even having to go so far as borrowing money from his parents to get by, but managed to build it back over a few years. By the time he died, his fortune was the equivalent to about $30 million today. Keynes was a lifelong member of the British Liberal Party, and through his connections and his newspaper, he had enormous influence in defining the party's ideology. He was a strong supporter of women's rights and outspoken about the need to reform the laws against homosexuality. Unfortunately, like many intellectuals of his day, Keynes was a proponent of eugenics and did not come to see the error of his ways. After the economic consequences of the peace, Keynes was a bit of an outcast from official government work. He turned his attention to his economic writing, and in the decade prior to the Great Depression, he started building the foundation of what would become his greatest work, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, which he published in 1936. World War II made him indispensable to the British government again, and unlike World War I, from which Keynes was spared from fighting as a conscientious objector to the war, Keynes believed it was incumbent on the world to actively defeat Nazism. After the war, Keynes helped restructure the system of international finance with the Bretton Woods Agreement, named for the place in New Hampshire where it was negotiated, which placed the American dollar rather than gold as the reserve currency of the world. Keynes died in 1946 at the age of 62 after a series of heart attacks. His ideas had already become the mainstream school of thought among economists, and his influence on economic thinking would only grow from there. When we look back to the time before and during the Great Depression, there is an ethos which is unfamiliar to us today. We wonder how and why President Herbert Hoover didn't do more for the economy during his term, and why voters were so resistant to the interventionalist policies proposed by William Jennings Bryan. In America, we had Franklin Roosevelt, who overturned that idea for us, but the rest of the world had John Maynard Keynes. And without his intellectual backing of the ideas, it's likely that Roosevelt would not have been able to do as much as he did. It's pretty likely that some of the ideas about the relationship between the government and the economy you hold in your head now originated in the mind of John Maynard Keynes. When Time magazine included Keynes among its most important people of the century in 1999, it stated that his radical idea that governments should spend money they don't have may have saved capitalism.